Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief Tax webcast series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Geography Update series and is titled 2024 Japan Tax Reform Proposals, Inflation, Investment and Inhibition. My name is David Bickle and I'm a tax partner based in our Tokyo office and I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. And I have four speakers with me today. Fumiko Mizuguchi, Ken Leong, Masaaki Miura, and also Brian Douglas. Mizuguchi-san leads Deloitte's indirect tax practice here in Japan, which covers not only Japanese consumption tax or JCT, but also trade and customs. And those of you who have worked with Mizuguchi-san before will also know her as a Steuerberater or licensed German tax accountant, which gives her deep expertise in European VAT as well. In addition to indirect tax, I am pleased to say that we have Mira San on the panel, who leads our GI3, or Global Investment Innovation Incentives Practice. And lastly, but by no means least, I'm delighted that my other two colleagues participating today are from the same group as me, which is our business tax group. And that's where Ken Leong is a partner and Brian Douglas is a managing director. And all of us are based here in Japan, and when not working from home, are located in our Tokyo office. And for further details, you can access our bios on the left-hand side of the screen. Now, before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of our webcast console. Firstly, all users are on listen-only mode. And if you have any content-related questions, you can submit these at any time in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom right of the screen. And we will do our best to respond to these questions during the presentation. Secondly, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at their convenience during the webcast. And you may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. And if you want to download today's slides and related publications, please go to the downloads and links box. Alternatively, if you are on the move today and are viewing from a mobile device, you can still see all of today's slides on screen and also reply to the survey questions as well. And thirdly, if you require an attendance record for this event, you will receive an automated email with a CPE certificate after watching for 50 minutes. Okay, so let's turn now to the theme of today's events and the topics we're going to cover. As a reminder, as I said before, the title of our webinar today is 2024 Tax Reform Proposals, Inflation, Investment and Inhibition. And in terms of understanding the context for these proposals, I think it's always helpful to, to step back in order to understand the government's policy priorities. And these are threefold. Firstly, to stimulate economic growth. Secondly, to mitigate geopolitical challenges and thirdly, to secure the tax base. In terms of economic growth, Japan's aspirations continue to be hindered by weak inflation, where the Bank of Japan has been unable to lift the rate to its target of 2%, stable 2%. Um, this is exacerbated by the fact that a significant portion of the inflation that Japan does have is actually of the wrong kind. It's driven by the high cost of energy, which is in part due to current global security challenges, and also to the high cost of imports generally, which is due to the weakness of the Japanese currency, the yen. And that yen weakness can be explained in part by the difference in dollar yen interest rates, and also partly by the desirability of what Japan has to sell to the rest of the world, meaning that strong demand for Japanese exports boosts, um, boosts the yen, and uh, and while demand itself is a complex response to different variables, ensuring that Japan is technologically competitive is certainly part of the solution. And to that end, the changes we see in the tax reform to R&D tax credit incentives and also the introduction of an innovation box are examples of how the government uses tax as a lever to support its policy objectives. And Connected to the persistently weak inflation is the failure to boost wages, salaries, and personal incomes needed to drive 
private consumption in Japan. And to boost demand, the government really wants to see more money in the pockets of consumers. And to that end, we see in the tax reform adjustments to the tax credit for wage increases to make it hopefully more impactful. Um, geopolitically, there are global and regional challenges for the Japanese government to deal with, including supply chain security and climate change, which have triggered the introduction of incentives to promote the domestic production of so-called strategic resources and also incentives for decarbonisation initiatives. And lastly, we see measures to secure the tax base, and this is happening through changes to the rules governing the application of JCT, the Japanese consumption tax, and also to factor-based enterprise tax. So in terms of the agenda, we'll begin with factor-based enterprise tax and the proposals to extend the number of entities to which this local tax regime applies. After that, we'll look at the latest installments in the evolution of Japan's indirect tax regime, both the changes to the designation of consumption taxpayer status and the obligations that come with that status, and uh, and some of the uh, some topical measures in connection with so-called platform taxation, which reflects the rising importance of e-commerce. From there, we'll tackle incentives, and finally, before moving to questions and answers, we'll provide a quick update on the most recent steps to rolling out the OECD's Pillar One and Pillar Two. So, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Ken. Uh, Ken, if you can, to kick us off, please, with factor-based enterprise tax. Thanks, David, and good afternoon to all. By way of background, Japanese corporate taxes comprise three components, a national tax, an inhabitants tax, and enterprise tax. The tax rates differ depending upon the paid-in capital of the company, and there are special rules which may treat a company with paid-in capital of 100 million yen or less as a large company. But as enterprise tax is deductible on a cash basis, the effective corporate tax rate is somewhere in the range of 30 to 35 percent. You'll note from this slide that for a company with paid in capital exceeding 100 million yen as of its fiscal year end, enterprise tax is imposed under the factor based system. Under this system, enterprise tax is calculated based on taxable income, a value added base, and a capital base, which is generally the total of paid in capital and capital surplus. The intention of the factor-based system is to ensure that large companies that are incurring tax losses are still liable to pay some tax by reference to the amount of their capital or key expenditures such as salaries, interest and rent. As the current factor-based system is applicable only to a company with paid in capital exceeding 100 million yen, this creates loopholes for a company to avoid the application of the factor-based system. The 2024 tax reform addresses these loopholes by expanding the scope of companies subject to the factor-based system, even where they have paid-in capital of 100 million yen or less. This will be achieved by the introduction of new rules relating to companies which undertake a capital reduction and certain 100% owned subsidiaries. First, let's look at the new rule applicable to capital reductions, which will be effective to fiscal years commencing on or after 1 April 2025, or 1 January 2026 for calendar year-end taxpayers. Under the current law, Japan sub can avoid the application of the factor-based system for FY 2026 by undertaking a capital reduction to transfer paid-in capital to capital surplus, so that its paid-in capital is 100 million yen or less at 31 December 2026. Under the new rule, Japan sub will continue to be subject to the factor-based system as Japan sub was subject to the factor-based system in the previous fiscal year, this would be yes, as Japan sub was subject to the factor-based system in FY 2025. Japan sub's paid in capital is 100 million yen or less, and the total amount of Japan sub's paid in capital and capital surplus exceeds 1 billion yen. Hmm. Uh, and Ken, thanks for that. And given that the capital reduction rule will not be effective until FY 2026 for at least for calendar year, uh, calendar year in companies. Is there any planning that companies can consider now, uh, assuming that that's consistent with their business objectives? That's a good question, David. It may be possible, but we need to consider a transitional measure which, which will apply to the capital reduction rule. So let's assume Japan sub undertakes the capital reduction during FY 2025 
it would not be subject to the factor-based system for FY 2025, which is the fiscal year preceding FY 2026, the first year during which the capital reduction rule is effective. But under the transitional rule, as the promulgation date of the new law is expected to be March uh, this year, and the relevant test year is FY 2023, during which Japan Sub was subject to the factor-based system. So in this case, Japan Sub will be subject to the factor-based system for FY 2026, notwithstanding that it was not subject to the factor-based system for FY 2025. The transitional rule may apply differently in a case-by-case -case basis. So if you would like to discuss further, please reach out to your Deloitte contact. Now let's take a look at a new rule which will apply to 100% subsidiaries. In this case, subsidiary has paid in capital of 100 million yen or less, and under the current law, it would not be subject to the factor-based system. Under the new rule, subsidiary will be subject to the factor-based system. If its total paid in capital and capital surplus exceeds 200 million yen, and subsidiary is 100% owned by a company whose total paid in capital and capital surplus exceeds 5 billion yen. This rule will be effective to fiscal years commencing on or after 1 April 2026, or 1 January 2027 for calendar year and taxpayers. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Ken. And as many of our audience attending today are from multinational groups with their own wholly owned Japanese subsidiaries, I'd like to uh, I'd like to bring in Brian here, please, to take us through this new rule in a bit more detail, including whether it will apply to foreign parented Japanese companies and the potential tax impact and other implications if it does. Uh, and maybe also uh, something about the anti-avoidance measures. So with that, Brian, thank you. Over to you. Uh, thanks, David, and, and thanks, Ken, for uh, setting this up. Um, I wanted to start the discussion of this part of the proposal related to enterprise tax by saying that there's been some question as to whether this proposal will apply to Japanese subsidiaries of foreign parented groups. And that uncertainty stems from uh, a note within the proposals that indicates that this new rule will not apply to a subsidiary whose parent company is not subject to factor-based enterprise tax. And most foreign parent companies, uh, unless they have a permanent establishment in Japan, are not subject to any enterprise tax. So taking a more literal reading, one interpretation could be that this proposal may not actually apply to a Japanese subsidiary of a foreign parented uh, company. However, you know, the thinking behind uh, this proposal is that even though a subsidiary may have a small amount of capital, it may benefit from being part of a, a group with a parent that has a large amount of capital. You know, perhaps it's easier to access funding. Uh, maybe customer suppliers are more willing to do business with that sub. And therefore, from an enterprise tax perspective, you know, why don't we treat that subsidiary the same as its larger parent company? And I think if we consider uh, this thinking, it would seem that there's no intention to exclude Japanese subsidiaries of foreign parented groups. Um, hopefully, we'll get more clarity uh, when the regulations are released, perhaps sometime in March. But uh, given that this has the potential to have a significant impact on foreign multinational groups for the purposes of today's discussion you know let's assume that this proposal will apply to japanese subsidiaries of foreign parented companies uh, and in that case uh, i think we'll see many japanese subsidiaries that are not currently subject to factor-based enterprise tax get pulled into the factor-based enterprise tax regime but what does this really mean well it, it means a few things First, uh, the subsidiary will have a reduced income levy, but it will be subject to uh, uh, new levies, such as the capital levy and a value added levy. And whether the aggregate uh, enterprise tax that the company will pay under the factor-based system will be larger or smaller will depend on the company's specific attributes. So highly profitable companies may actually see a decrease in their total enterprise tax liability while companies with a high amount of capital uh, might see an increase. Second, the overall effective tax rate of the company uh, will drop, typically from 34, 35% down to 30%. Um, and, and this would impact companies' deferred tax uh, calculation and provision. 
third, uh, as the value added levy and the capital levy are generally uh, above the line taxes, meaning they're booked above the profit before income tax line. You know, this might impact the businesses that use that profit before income tax as, as a KPI. And finally, the value added levy and the capital levy are typically not creditable under other jurisdictions' corporate income tax laws. So where the company may have used enterprise taxes to offset some of the taxes in their home country, you know, that amount available to offset will likely uh, be uh, reduced. Thanks, Brian. Um, and while this proposal is not expected to take effect until 1st of April 2026, it sounds like companies may want to simulate what the potential tax impact might be if they are subject to this proposal. And, uh, and if the result is that the company will be subject to more enterprise tax, is there anything in line with business objectives that these companies can try and do to, to, to mitigate this liability? Yeah, well, maybe maybe two points on that, David. Um, first, the uh, proposal comes with some transition rules that will allow companies uh, which have a greater tax liability under the factor-based regime compared to the regular enter uh, enterprise tax regime to reduce that excess by two-thirds in the first year and by one-third in, in the second year. Uh, second, if a company has a significant amount of capital, which is causing the increase in the liability, and that capital is no longer needed in the business, it, it may be possible to distribute that capital out uh, to the parent company. Uh, of course, there are tax, legal, uh, business implications that would need to be considered uh, if that is, uh, distribution is to be undertaken. And, and I should add here that you know any distribution out of capital after the date of promulgation uh, will be clawed back for the purposes of determining whether a Japanese subsidiary is subject to this proposal. So in other words, making a distribution out of capital may not get a company out of uh, the factor-based tax regime, but it may help mitigate the impact. Okay, thank you very much for that, Brian. And that actually brings us to the first polling question of the day, which is, and you can read in your screen, does your company have at least one Japanese subsidiary that is not that is not subject to factor-based enterprise tax, uh, which we said is generally companies with paid-in capital of 100 million yen or less? And the options are yes, uh, yes, we have at least one Japan sub that is not subject to factor-based tax or no, uh, we don't have any Japanese subsidiaries, or no, all of our Japanese subsidiaries are already subject to factor-based enterprise tax. And lastly, uh, if you're unsure, please use the uh, don't know option. Uh, and Brian, whilst we're waiting for the results to come in, you mentioned that the deferred tax calculations may be impacted. Can you just elaborate a bit more on that? And perhaps comment on what companies should be thinking about in connection with deferred taxes? Sure, so, so generally a company would calculate their deferred tax asset or liability um, you know, based on the tax rate uh, at which the item giving rise to the deferred tax will reverse in the future. So for example, an NOL will give rise to a deferred tax asset, but the amount of that deferred tax asset will depend on the effective rate at the time the NOL is expected to be utilized. So for a calendar year taxpayer that will be subject to this proposal, any portion of the NOL that will be uh, expected to be utilized in 2027 or after will need to be calculated at the lower effective tax rate that's associated with the factor-based enterprise tax. Thanks for that, Brian. And uh, nicely timed, we can see, well, yes, uh, there, out of the responses there, there are companies that have at least one Japan subject, uh, one Japan sub that is not subject to factor-based enterprise tax. So that's more than one third. So I think that backs up the, um, you know, the comment that it's advisable for these companies to be trying to do some simulation now, or at least considering uh, what could the impact be if that particular company was to become subject to factor-based enterprise tax under this new regime. So 
worthwhile uh, considering in advance what might happen. Okay, um, well, thank you very much for that, Brian. Uh, and at this point, I'd like us to leave uh, enterprise tax uh, behind for now and move into the realm of Japanese consumption tax, where, as I mentioned, there are several key updates in this reform, in particular, the introduction of a platform taxation regime on the 1st of April 2025, next year. Um, now, mizuguchi san uh, I can see you on camera, thank you. I'd like to bring you here in a moment to take us through the discussion of platform taxation. But first of all, I want to flag to today's uh, listeners that um, you were actually part of the working group put together by MOF, the Ministry of Finance, to shape the legal framework of these proposed rules. So in that regard, uh, we certainly feel lucky to have you here today to provide your insights. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yes, I was fortunate enough to be commissioned to participate in four sessions hosted by the Ministry of Finance last year to discuss the platform taxation law and the purpose of the new rules. Now, as for the proposed rules, as you can see on the right hand side of that slide, these confirm that when foreign enterprises provide business to consumer digital services, such as ebooks, e music, and cloud services through a digital platform and receive consideration through a specified platform operator, the provision of these services will be considered to have been made by the specified platform operator. That operator, David, will be required to submit a JCT return to the Japan tax authorities and remit the applicable tax on the facilitated digital sales, digital services subject to JCT. Uh, and just a moment, when you refer to a specified platform operator, who exactly are you referring to? So David, the tax authority will designate a platform operator as a specified platform operator. If the total consideration for the facilitated digital services exceeds 5 billion yen, which is about 34 million US dollars within a tax period. When the tax authority designates any specified platform operator, the operator will be notified to that effect and its details will be published. As you can see from the timeline on the slide, next slide please. If a platform operator's facilitator sales exceed 5 billion yen in the tax period which ends before 31st July 2024, a notification must be submitted to the tax authority by 30th September 2024. Upon doing so, the platform operator will be designated as a specified platform operator by 31st December this year. As for tax periods ending after 31st July 2024, platform operators must, must assess whether their facilitator sales exceeds the specified threshold in the tax period and notify the tax authority, if so, before the filing deadline of the JCT return for that tax period. Yeah, thanks for that explanation, Mr. Gujisan. And I guess these proposed rules firmly put the onus on the platform business operators who are, particularly in this case, in a better position to collect and remit the JCT, the, the consumption tax. Yes, that's that's right, David. And we have seen a number of jurisdictions that have implemented similar measures report positive outcomes in securing additional tax revenue and reducing the perceived inequality resulting from outdated laws. Okay, and so for any of our listeners out there that might be from, might themselves be from platform operators, what happens if they are a specified platform operator going forward? From 1st April 2025, you will be required to disclose in your JCT return your facilitated sales and pay the corresponding JCT amount. So for our inbound clients with December year ends, this means that your 
fiscal year 2025 JCT return must include these facilitated sales. Okay, thanks, Ms. Gutisan. Um, and just before we move on to other JCT topics, I'd like us to elaborate on one point, and that is that only digital services provided to consumers, consumers by foreign enterprises, are subject to these proposed rules. So in connection with that, I think I, my, my question is twofold. Firstly, you know, are digital services provided solely to businesses? Are they excluded? And secondly, are platform operators required to remit JCT on sales made by Japanese providers of B2C or B, uh, business to consumer digital services? Okay, to answer your first question, in Japan, the JCT on cross-border business to business or B2B sales of digital services will continue to be collected through the reverse charge mechanism as there are no perceived issues there. As for your second question, the Japanese tax authorities have other ways to ensure domestic service providers are charging and remitting the, the appropriate JCT, so their sales are excluded from the, the rules. This, however, does mean platform operators need to distinguish between foreign and domestic service providers. Okay, th thank you for that, Ms. Gutisan. And this actually brings us to our second polling question of the day, which is a, um, I think a little bit of market research. And that question is, um, if you are a foreign digital service provider, do you sell your digital services to Japanese customers via a third party platform? And your options here are yes, uh, meaning yes, you are selling digital services to Japan customers via a third party platform. Uh, second option is no, uh, you are not selling digital services to Japan customers via a third party platform. And the third option is uh, not sure, or in this case, if you're not working for a platform, not applicable. Um, now, Ms. Goodsan, while we're waiting for the results to come in, um, could you please briefly explain what impact the platform taxation may have on platforms and foreign foreign service providers? Thanks, David. So I guess the key takeaway for listeners is that if you are a platform business operator facilitating the supply of B2C digital services for foreign enterprises, you will need to assess whether you are likely to be treated as a specified platform operator. And if yes, start planning for essential system modifications and new compliance requirements. If you are a foreign enterprise providing B2C digital services through digital platforms and receive consideration, you will need to start planning for, depending on the platforms which are likely to become specified platform operators or not, how your JCT should be accounted for on your sales. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Gujisan. And uh, perhaps as expected, um, you know, we've got a large number of people that are a uh, large number of listeners today that are not sure or to, to which this uh, question is not applicable. But certainly for those that it, uh, uh, that it is relevant to, um, we have, um, again, way over one third uh, who are no, not selling uh, digital services to Japan via third party platform, but still. Uh, a significant minority who are. So uh, I think platform taxation is something that um, as e-commerce continues to grow, we need to keep an eye on. Uh, it's something that's happening in other countries as well. So, uh, you know, continue to watch this space going forward. Okay, um, Mr. Goodson, uh, turning now then to some of the other JCT related tax reforms uh, in the 2024 proposals, can you please begin by taking us through the changes to the determination of whether an enterprise itself is a taxpayer specifically for JCT purposes? Sure, but first let me give an overview of Japan's rules with respect to the determination of an enterprise's JCT status. Japan does not have a JCT registration system similar to that in the EU or other countries with indirect tax regimes. Instead, taxpayers who are not registered as a qualified invoice issuer 
are required to determine whether they are a JCT taxpayer, meaning an entity with a JCT reporting remittance obligation, or a JCT exempt enterprise, meaning an entity without a JCT reporting remittance obligation for each fiscal year using several prescribed tests under the JCT law. Within these prescribed tests exist several perceived loopholes. Therefore, it is widely known that under the JCT law, in principle, a taxpayer is treated as JCT exempt during the first two years of its business life. This rule has been abused in many ways. The government is intent on closing these loopholes, as we will see that is evident in the following raft of proposals. First, the so-called specified period test was introduced years ago. Under this test, if a taxpayer's JCT taxable sales in the first six months of the prior fiscal year exceeds 10 million yen, the taxpayer is not a JCT exempt enterprise. Therefore, if you had decent sales during your first year of business, in the second year, you would be a JCT taxpayer and obliged to remit JCT. In reality, the test, however, did not work well when applied to foreign businesses who used the total salary amount paid to Japan resident employees, which is allowed under the current law, instead of using the taxable sales amount from the first six months of the prior fiscal year to assess whether they had exceeded the threshold. As we know, David, foreign businesses without any office in Japan usually do not pay any salary to Japan resident employees. So essentially, by default, these uh, foreign businesses could enjoy a two-year tax holiday because of the loophole in the specified period test. Under the revised rules, foreign enterprises will not be able to use the salary amount as consideration in the specified period test to determine whether they are required to pay JCT in the current fiscal year. Instead, it must only use its taxable sales amount in the first half of the pre preceding fiscal year. Mm. So, so I guess, Ms. Akuji san that by removing the salary criteria, foreign suppliers without any presence in Japan who are unlikely to pay salaries to Japanese employees may be treated as JCT taxpayers from the second year uh, if their taxable sales exceeded 10 million yen, that 10 million yen threshold in the first year. Yes, and that is the purpose of this reform to minimize the possibility of excluding taxpayers from the JCT net because of their overseas business operations. Okay, thank you. Um, and we're going to look at a couple more uh, issues. And I understand that the, the next two measures also relate to the determination of whether an enterprise is a so-called JCT taxpayer. Yes, that's right, David. As I mentioned earlier, there are several prescribed tests which are applied to assess a taxpayer's JCT profile. Two of those tests, the share capital test and capital relationship test, are traditionally applied when an enterprise is considered to be newly established. In other words, it has been operating for less than two years and has no base period. In some instances, taxpayers were taking advantage of these rules to utilize the two-year look-back rule and avoid having any JCT obligations for several years. To prevent this, new revisions have been proposed. Turning firstly to the share capital test, currently a foreign enterprise will be treated as JCT taxpayer if its amount of share capital at the beginning of the fiscal year is 10 million yen or more. Under the new measure, this test will apply to foreign enterprises during their first two years of doing business in Japan, even if they have a base period and are more than two fiscal years old. Next, the capital relationship test. Uh, 
Under the current rule, to prevent taxpayers from establishing a new entity every two years through corporate restructuring, newly established entities, which are directly or indirectly controlled by a person or persons, and one of the related parties has taxable sales exceeding 50 million yen, are excluded from the scope of exempt enterprises. Under the new rule, global income will be also taken into consideration. And if the related party has global income exceeding 5 billion yen, approximately $33 million, the tax exemption will not apply. Now, this test will apply to all foreign entities during their first two years of doing business in Japan, even if they have a base period and are more than two fiscal years old. Mm. Excellent, Mr. Good san And just to confirm, these revisions will be effective from the 1st of October in this year, 2024. Is that correct? Yes, David, that's correct. More precisely, the new rules will be applicable for a fiscal year which starts after 1st October 2024. So for our listeners out there today, if you have been making taxable sales in Japan for the last several years, but under the current rules have not been treated as a JCD taxpayer, you may need to reassess your status in light of these revisions. Okay, thank you. And now, before we move on to tax incentives, our next item on the agenda, uh, there were also some changes made to prevent foreign enterprises that do not have a PE, a permanent establishment in Japan, from arbitrarily, if you like, arbitrarily taking an input tax credit. Yes, David. These changes were made to the simplified taxation system, or as it is referred to in Europe, the flat rate scheme and the small to medium sized business exemption during the transitional period for the qualified invoice system. Currently, under both systems, a foreign taxpayer can calculate its JCT liability based on a prescribed deemed purchase rate, irrespective of whether it actually incurred any expenses. Under the proposed new measures, from 1st October 2024, a foreign taxpayer without a PE in Japan on the first day of the tax period will not be allowed to apply either of these calculation methods. Instead, a foreign taxpayer must calculate its JCT tax liability based on the actual input and output JCT amounts. So for listeners, that don't have a PE in Japan and are using these measures to calculate input JCT. These measures will apply as early as fiscal year 2025 if you have a December year end. Finally, David, the last JCT measure is in relation to claiming an input tax deduction on taxable purchases from exempt enterprises under the revision, if the total amount of taxable purchases from a JCT exempt enterprise exceeds 1 billion yen per enterprise with a fiscal, within a fiscal year, the deduction of input JCT on the exceeding amount will be disallowed. Thanks very much for that, Mr. Gudisan. And um, at this point, I'd like us to change direction uh, to leave behind uh, JCT and indirect tax and begin our focus on incentives, starting with changes to the uh, research and development, the R&D tax credit. So um, if I can just bring uh, Brian, if I can bring you back in here just at the beginning to talk about R&D credits, that would be great. Over to you. Sure, David, thanks. Just some uh, minor revisions to the R&D credit system aimed at discouraging companies from reducing their R&D spend. So the, the graph on the slide shows the R&D uh, credit curve with the percentage of change in a company's R&D spend on the horizontal axis and the percentage of that R&D spend that may be creditable on the vertical axis. So the more uh, the R&D spend is increased, the higher the percent of that spend uh, which is creditable. 
so two main revisions here. Uh, first, the floor of the creditable R&D spend will be eliminated, meaning that companies that reduce their R&D spend by a certain amount may not be able to take any R&D credit. And second, the R&D credit curve will become steeper for companies that reduce their uh, spend, meaning uh, the greater the reduction in R&D spend, an even lower percentage of that spend that will be creditable and a quicker it make it to a zero credit. Okay, thanks very much for that, Brian. And um, you know, the R&D tax credit is one that we've had for a number of years now. But in terms of looking at um, looking at the new opportunities introduced by the tax reform proposals, I'd like to bring in Mirasan uh, as our resident expert on incentives. So. Uh, Mirasan Masaki, um, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, David. So um, I would like to explain tax incentives for promoting domestic production of strategic resources, which was created in the 2024 tax reform. Um, as you already understood, um, industrial policies are becoming more active around the globe with a growing movement to attract investment into their own countries. For example, in the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act were enacted in the past few years. And similarly, in the EU, the Green Deal industrial policy has been established. With that, a new tax incentive will be introduced from FY 2024, which will provide corporate tax credit over a 10-year period. In this incentive, three areas where long-term strategic investment are deemed to be essential for Japan, including digital transformation, green transformation, and economic security. The Japanese government believes that companies are hesitant to invest aggressively in these three areas as they are not yet matured industries and future profits are uncertain. However, the growth and development of these three areas are deemed necessary for the future growth of Japan. Therefore, it has been proposed that the government supports the initial stage of commercialization. In three strategic areas, five products are specifically targeted. One, semiconductors. Two, electric vehicles. Three, green steel. Four, green chemicals. And five, sustainable aviation fuel or SAP. At this point of time, it is only announced that those products are selected and it is still uncertain that finished products are only the target or its material are also within the scope. It is expected that the detailed guideline will be come out in a few months. So um, this slide provides you an overview of the tax credit. First, in order to get the tax benefit from this incentive, companies must develop a business adaptation plan for the manufacture and sales of the targeted product called industrial competitiveness based enhancement product, or by taking the first word ICBEP and obtain government approval. And then companies can receive a tax credit when they acquire depreciable asset to manufacture the product. Described in, the, described in the plan and use them for business purposes. The tax credit will be calculated at the lesser of the amount based on the production and sales volume or the acquisition cost of the asset to manufacture a eligible product. Companies are required to prepare the business adaptation plan and receive a, approval from the government by the end of March 2027 but they can get tax benefit for a period of 10 years from the date of the approval of the plan. So this list on the slide shows the specific tax credit amount, meaning the unit tax deduction price for each targeted product. Please note that the tax credit will be phased out after the seventh anniversary of the date where the um, eligible sales, eligible assets are placed for the business use. In the eighth year, it will be equivalent to 75% of the initial amount. A ninth year, the, um, to be equivalent to uh, 50%, and the 10th year, to be equivalent to 25%. Mm. Uh, uh, Mirasan, I understand that Japan's tax policies historically provided tax benefits for initial, initial investments, but my understanding, 
is that this particular tax incentive is something completely new in terms of its structure. Uh, is that right? Yes, that's right, David. So um, as far as I know, all the tax incentives we had in the past here in Japan were structured to support companies' initial payment, initial investment. However, this incentive provides tax credit for 10 years, so it is completely new. If you look around the world, for example, in the United States, there are tax systems created to support companies' investment on a long-run basis, and in India, um, there are subsidy schemes based on the production volume. So it can be said that the Japanese government referred to those incentives in the other countries. So um, next topic, um, I'd like to move on to the investment innovation box. So I think many of you have already heard of this incentive since some of the major countries have been um, have already implemented it under the name of innovation box or patent box. In Japan, we have R&D tax incentives, but we do not have the incentives for intangible properties. Therefore, it is also a new incentive. Please note, although it was announced in um, FY 2024 tax reform, it is scheduled for the implementation after FY 2025. This incentive is expected to last seven years. Eligible transactions for these incentives are one, IP transfer transaction with unrelated party, Japanese residents or domestic corporations, and two, IP license transaction with foreign and domestic related parties, unrelated parties, sorry. Um, in other words, the transactions with related parties are not eligible. It is also worth mentioning that embedded IP, meaning the consideration for the use of IP being embedded in the price of a product, is not included in the scope of the eligible transactions. In some countries, embedded IP is eligible for the tax incentive, but according to the tax reform, it is not the case with Japan. Uh, the slide describes the specific calculation method of innovation box. The amount equal to 30% of the lesser of the amount, one amount of income, or two, the eligible income amount, eligible income amount derived from the um, eligible IP can be deducted from income for the same fiscal year. The formula for the calculation is shown on the upper right hand side. It is described as self creation ratio, but it is the same concept of nexus ratio which is mentioned in OECD Action 5. You should also keep in mind that there is a transitional measures for the allocation of self-creation ratio. I will not explain in detail due to um, time constraints, but uh, please note that the calculation method differs from before March 2027 and after April 2027. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mira -san. and quite a bit there to to digest and you mentioned that only the transactions with third party companies are eligible for this innovation box so mm -hmm. you know are there any points though that should be considered by japanese subsidiaries of foreign parented companies mm, that's a great point david so um first um, in the case of Japanese subsidiaries of foreign companies, it is not always common that the Japanese subsidiary owns the IP. Even if the subsidy, uh, subsidiary does own IP, does own their IP, the cases where the IP is licensed to unrelated party or uh, where the IP is transferred from the Japanese subsidiary to unrelated uh, party in Japan are, I think, limited. So um, in some innovation box scheme with other countries, licensing and transfer of IP within the group are sometimes treated as qualified transactions. And it is um, in such cases, the location of IP within the group becomes a point of discussion. However, in the new system in Japan, um, transactions with the group are excluded, as I mentioned. So um, it's assumed that it is less likely to become a topic of the active discussion. But I recommend you to check out the detail of the incentives as to how it will be enacted. I think it will be um, come out in a few months. Okay, so next topic. Um, I'd like to explain tax incentive for promoting investment for carbon neutrality. 
This incentive was created in the 2021 tax reform, and it was announced in the 2024 tax reform that it will be extended for two years with some revisions. So um, I'm going to highlight three major changes here. The first one, the first major changes is that the capital investment to facilities for certain demand creation uh, creating product, which used to be the part of the eligible investment, will no longer qualified for the tax incentives. Only the investment which contribute improvement of the company's carbon productivity will be qualified. For example, installation of new machinery for the purpose of decarbonization and or um, solar power generation equipment. Those are, are considered to be eligible. The second point is that um, tightening of the requirements for the improvement of carbon productivity. Under the current system, large companies are need to um, increase carbon productivity by at least 7%. On the other hand, under the new system, they will need to improve it by at least 50%. 15%, sorry. So um, the last point is that the change in the eligible assets. While railroad vehicles will be added to the eligible asset, lightning equipment and the personal air conditioning equipment will be excluded from the list. Uh, and um, Masaki-san, I think many countries around the world are rolling out support for decarbonization in relation to climate change. But uh, I'm wondering, does Japan have any other support measures besides this? Mm. Yes, um, that's right, David. So um, there are some other support measures in addition to carbon neutral tax incentives. For example, uh, many subsidy schemes have been announced by the um, Japanese government <clears throat> and the local government too. For the latest budget, the details are now discussed in a diet and it is expected that they will be come out in a few months. Uh, companies may be able to get both benefit from tax incentives and subsidy scheme. So we recommend you to consider applying for it, especially when you have capital investments come in Japan as part of the group's efforts to become carbon neutral. So back to you, David. Okay, thanks, Masaki. And um, just staying on incentives but moving away from some of these uh, new and innovative uh, incentives and coming back to one that we've had for a number of years and this is the tax uh, credit for increasing salaries um ken can i just bring you back in here now just to uh, take us through what's changed in the the salary increase credit yes thanks david uh, the salary tax credit is intended to encourage companies to increase their employee salaries and is calculated as a percentage of the increase for companies' current year salaries over the prior year amount. The amount of the credit is capped at 20% of the company's uh, corporate tax liability. As David alluded to earlier, Japan's economy faces several challenges, including having been trapped in a deflationary cycle for more than two decades, stagnant wages, which further contribute to this, declining birth rates, and a lack of participation and support for women in the workforce. Over recent years, the qualifying conditions for the salary tax credit have been amended, with each revision reflecting the current administration's economic policies and goals. With this background in mind, let's look at the proposed changes to the salary tax credit in the 2024 tax reform. First, for large companies with more than 2,000 employees. The goal here is for these large employers, which have the greatest financial capacity, to bear more responsibility for increasing salaries, promoting child-friendly work environments, and supporting increased participation of women in the workforce. To achieve this, the current maximum credit ratio of 25%, which can be obtained with a 4% increase in salaries, will be replaced with a 7% increase. Further, the current additional credit ratio of 5% for an increase in education and training costs will be supplemented by an additional 5% credit ratio if the company is certified as supporting parenting or women's empowerment. Next, the government expects that large companies with 2,000 employees or less, which far outnumber companies with 2,000 or more employees, should have an important role in meeting Japan's economic challenges. For these companies, the maximum credit ratio of 25%, which can be obtained with a 4% increase in salaries, won't be changed. <clears throat> 
Rather, the current additional credit ratio of 5% for an increase in education and training costs will be supplemented by an additional 5% credit ratio if the company is certified as supporting parenting or women's empowerment, or it obtains certification as significantly supporting women's empowerment during the fiscal year. And finally, for small and medium-sized companies or SMEs, in general, SMEs are granted preferential treatment in a variety of areas, including a greater salary tax credit rate. Under the proposed tax reform, the minimum salary tax credit rates for SMEs will not be reduced, unlike for large companies. In addition, the current additional credit ratio of 10% for an increase in education and training costs will be supplemented by an additional 5% credit ratio if the company is certified as supporting parenting or women's empowerment or it obtains certification significantly supporting parenting or women's empowerment during the fiscal year. And finally, in order to encourage loss-making SMEs which cannot benefit from the tax credit under the current rules, a five-year carry forward will be allowed. Back to you, David. Thanks very much, Ken. And I think that wraps up our discussion today on incentives, always something very <clears throat> of great interest to inbound investors into Japan. Um, as we're coming towards the end of the session, though, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit uh, and bring uh, Brian back in, if I can, just to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, with the OECD's changes, uh, something we see an awful lot about. Uh, firstly, Pillar 1, dealing with profit allocation and nexus, uh, and in particular, Pillar 2, dealing with a global minimum tax. Um, anything around these proposals, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, in the tax reform, Brian? Yeah, well, uh, with respect to uh, Pillar 1, there was no mention uh, of that in the proposals and nothing really concrete with respect to uh, Pillar 2, but the uh, the reform outline did indicate that the qualified domestic minimum top-up tax may be considered in next year's uh, proposal. However, as a reminder, the 2023 tax reform introduced the income inclusion rule in Japan, which will take effect for years starting on or after the 1st of April this year, 2024, with the uh, first filing due date for the GLOBE information return in September 2026. And I think it's worth pointing out that while we would expect that the ultimate parent entity or another entity within the group to file the GLOBE information return, thus relieving the Japan subsidiaries of their obligation, you know, because of the rolling implementation of the income inclusion rule, different jurisdictions are implementing Pillar 2 rules at different times, and because Japan's a fairly early adopter of the rules, there are situations in where, where that GLOBE information return uh, will be required to be filed by the Japanese subsidiary, at least for the initial year. Also, one, one other thing I'd like to mention from an international tax perspective is that the proposal includes a temporary extension of the carryover period of excess interest. Um, under Japan's earnings stripping rule, which will deny a deduction of interest expense that exceeds 20% of a company's adjusted income. So with uh, global interest rates increasing, you know, some companies are seeing their interest expense rise and are being uh, limited in their deduction due to earnings stripping rules. So this proposal is really aimed at giving companies more time to recover non-deductible interest expense in a later year. Okay, well, thank you, Brian. And uh, also, Ken, Masaki, and uh, Fumiko Mizuguchi-san. This actually brings us to the end of our discussion today. Uh, and I think we have just um, maybe one minute to uh, take a look at one of the questions that have come in. Uh, certainly, anecdotally, uh, in recent weeks, I've been hearing a lot of interest in connection with uh, enterprise tax, factor-based enterprise tax, so, uh, Brian, a quick question for you, uh, I think, in relation to factor-based enterprise tax, um, and quite a simple one. Um, when will the proposal for the enterprise tax be enacted? Ah, well, I, I think uh, we expect uh, that proposal plus other proposals to be enacted in uh, March. And, and I guess with respect to enterprise tax, that's an important uh, date because uh, you know it, it may uh, trigger the timing at which you know companies may need to reassess their deferred uh, tax uh, provision, which we discussed uh, earlier. So companies may need to actually uh, do some work to determine whether they're subject to this 
new factor-based enterprise tax rule you know, sooner than the effective date of you know, 2027, 2026, when these rules actually become effective. Okay, thanks, Brian. And just uh, in our final minute, um, question here, uh, Murasan. Uh, do you think, so the question is, do you think that the Japanese subsidiaries of foreign companies, so Japanese subsidiaries of foreign companies are also widely utilizing Japanese tax and non-tax incentives? Yeah, that's an interesting question, David. So um, my answer here is yes and no. So for the non-tax incentives, such as subsidies, I would say um, it is widely utilized recently. For example, semiconductor related companies are establishing new factories, facilities in Japan and have been um, receiving substantial amount of subsidies from the Japanese government. But for the tax incentives, I would say um, partially no. Of course, there are a few number of cases where Japanese subsidiaries utilize the tax incentives, but at the same time, I feel that um, those incentives are not well known among Japanese subsidiaries or foreign companies. So um, I would say there are cases where opportunities to utilize them are being missed. So if you only have a Japanese branch, um, that opportunities utilizing those incentives are not so significant. But if you have Japanese subsidiaries, you can utilize um, incentives just as Japanese headquarters companies can do in principle. Okay, thanks, Mira-san. So I think that's a great message to end on that it's important to be uh, alert and aware of the opportunities that are available uh, in Japan in terms of potential preferential tax treatments. Well, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. So thank you once again to uh, Brian, Fumiko, Ken and Masaki, and special thanks to all of you in our audience who were able to join us today. We would like to encourage you to fill out the short survey that is going to pop up on your screen momentarily and tell us what you think about today's program. And if you joined us late, please note that this presentation, like all our other ones, will be archived for future viewing. So if you feel that others will benefit from this webcast, please share the webcast via the share this icon or please do have them join or visit the debriefs website and we will respond to all of the questions submitted during today's webcast during the next couple of weeks and also if you think of any other questions or comments later on then please do feel free to reach out either to me or to one of my uh, one of our speakers and of course we'd be more than happy to talk to you so at last, from all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in Deloitte's Asia-Pacific tax webcast today. Goodbye.